the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Without a doubt, love is one of the most powerful of human emotions, yet the least explainable. So much has been claimed for love that it makes the world go round, that it conquers all, that it is blind, and so forth. What if love were not merely an emotion, but a manifestation of the spirit? What would this spirit of love do if it were denied, rejected, and banished. That is the premise of the strange story we will shortly unfold. I believe your problem, Professor, is that you want no one to get close to you. You're right. I can't stand intimacy. Those who don't want things often get them. Then I ought to have affection poured all over me, because I hate it. Who knows? Perhaps you will. I hope not. I'd rather die first. Our mystery drama, Shadow of Love, adapted from a story by Robert Hitchens, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Robert Dryden and Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Is love just a feeling, or could it be a real being? That is what is behind this unbelievable story of the friendship of a scientist and a priest. People who knew them both often wondered what these two had in common. One was all skeptic and the other all faith. Let us hear from the latter, Father Xavier Murchison. Professor Gildea was not one of my parishioners. My parish is way downtown. The people are poor. On weekdays, the basement of St. Xavier's is a recreation hall welcoming the kids of the Lower East Side. The professor lived on the Upper East Side. But what a lonely fellow he was. His own doing, of course. A brilliant scientist lecturing everywhere, but who avoided human personal contact of any intimate nature. Gildea was the only man I've ever met who disliked love or any form of affection. It repelled him. At any rate, how we met, it was at one of his lectures. A professor Gildea? Yes? Yeah? Oh, I see you're a priest. I should have said yes, father, since you were kind enough to call me professor without knowing what I profess. I had to come backstage to tell you how very much I enjoyed what you said tonight. Really? I shouldn't have thought we scientific doubting Thomases had much in common with a man who has blind faith. Oh, not blind, Professor. We have faith because our eyes have been opened. Just as St. Thomas were. You intrigue me, Father. Would you like to have dinner with me one day next week at my place? I'm flattered that I would interest a scientific mind. Well, don't be. It's not personal, Father. I've spent a lifetime investigating... How can I overlook religion? How about dinner, say, next Sunday? I'm preaching the evening service at our church downtown. Well, come afterwards. I'll write down the address on Fifth Avenue. I'm right opposite Central Park. Uh, oh, I never got your name, Father. Xavier Murchison. We became friends. Certainly an unholy alliance. I think I pitied Gildea. This hard-working, eminently successful man of the big brain who never wanted anyone to help him. Friends. Oh, they're few and far between. Well, that's because you don't like people. Very few. In fact, none. I realize that straight off. You want no one to get close to you. You're right, Father. 
I cannot stand intimacy. It's interesting that you want so very little out of life. It's my bed. I made it and I lie on it. Those who don't want things often get them. While those who spend a lifetime searching for something generally don't. Then I ought to have affection poured all over me. Because I hate it. Perhaps someday you will. I hope not. I'd rather die first. A prophetic statement. But at the time, how did I know? How could I? And then it began. The events that changed Gildea's life completely. One Sunday, I arrived for our weekly dinner early. Pitting, the professor's assistant and houseman let me in. Oh, good evening, Father Murchison. Evening, Pitting. Professor Holmes? No, not yet, Father. He's been out all day and a late appointment with his publishers. His first two books sold so well, they're asking for another. Well, I'd say that was good news. Hello there, Pitting. Did Father Murchison arrive? <coughs> ah, there you are. I'm sorry I was detained. A Pitting, dinner in half an hour and drinks right now in the library. Very good, sir. Oh, and a uh, Pitting. How is Napoleon today? Oh, very well, sir, I believe. I removed the cover from his cage. I believe you forgot, sir, when you left early this morning. I did not forget. When I want that parrot uncovered, I shall do so myself. There is a reason for what I do. And I would thank you kindly not to undo what I have done without asking me first. This extraordinary outburst about the uncovering of a parrot was the first sign of many to come, which, uh... uh but I don't want to get ahead of my story. Pitting brought the drinks into the study, quickly covered the parrot, and disappeared. I, uh... I suppose I was a bit heavy-handed, wasn't I? I apologize for the brouhaha about Napoleon, but I had my reasons for wanting him kept covered. You've had this parrot a long time. I, uh... I was making a study of the imitative powers of birds a while back, and I never got rid of him. Uh, but for reasons of my own, right now, I want him shut up in darkness. Uh, Father, uh, Father, do you think that I'm an attractive man? Well, bless me, I don't know. I mean, do you think that there's anything about me which might draw a human being or an animal irresistibly to me? Whether you desire it or not? Definitely, if I did not desire it. I imagine it would be very disagreeable to be liked, to be run after by anybody one objected to. Or by any thing. Oh, that's horrible. What are you saying, Professor Gildare? Father Murchison, I have no one I can tell this to, so... Well, shall we say that you're elected? How much time do we have before dinner? Enough. Uh, uh, come with me out the front door. <laughs> As you can see, my house faces Central Park. My brownstone is just across Fifth Avenue, opposite that path there into the park. Ah, I see a bench just behind the tree. I suppose you're out there often. Well, sometimes, not often. Generally, I stand at my door, take a few deep breaths, and then go on in to dinner and spend the evening working. I dare say if I lived here, I'd be out there morning, noon, and night. So peaceful. Yes. Well, uh... A few nights ago, a Thursday, I came out, as I do, and I, I stood here. On that bench, I saw a dark object sitting its back to me. I couldn't tell if it was a man, woman, or child. You know, right away, I had a most peculiar feeling about it. I wanted to go and get close to it, but I couldn't move. I just stood here where I am now... My thoughts drawn to this person or thing on that bench. Thing? Well, why it took such hold over my imagination, I don't know. Finally, I forced myself to cross the street and walk up the path to the bench. And? Well, it, it wasn't there. I hadn't taken my eyes off it, but it had disappeared. I looked up and down the path everywhere. It was gone. But for some strange reason, I was hurt. Angry. I turned around, came back here, and found that I had left the door open. Not advisable in any neighborhood in the city at night. 
In that little time, it's not likely anybody could have come in here without you seeing them. Uh, interesting what you say, but you're wrong. There was someone here. Huh? Did you catch them? Well, that's just it. Now, I'm not a man of hysterical imagination. The moment I came in this door, I knew... I knew... There was somebody here. Not my man pitting, but the very same person or thing I had seen on that park bench. I just knew it. I was so positive, I... I walked right upstairs, expecting to find this visitor waiting for me. And... No one there. I came down again, went into the kitchen. No one. I beg your pardon, Professor Gildare. Dinner is served. Ah, thank you, Pitting. We'll be along directly. A delicious meal, Professor. Thank you. Now, I'm anxious to hear more. Yes, well, uh... Uh, that night, I, I went to bed, slept well. But when I arose the next morning, I I knew the presence was still in this house. You didn't see it, but you knew it. Mental sensation. I knew it was here. I, uh, I went to my study. I worked hard. I had lunch. At two o'clock, I was due at a lecture. I left the house, and suddenly I was aware I was alone... The thing had not followed me into the street. That evening, when I came home, it was still here. I sensed it was very attentive to me, concerned. And by the time I got up to go to bed, I realized what the presence was up to. What was it? It, uh... It was personally interested in me. You felt that? Oh, yes. Yes, it was... It was fond or becoming fond of me. Uh, Father, I want you to see something. Mm. Now, I'm going over to the corner of the room, and I'm taking the cloth from the parrot cage. There we are. Now, Father Murchison, have a good look at the parrot. Now, tell me what you see. Ooh, Napoleon seems to be asleep on his perch. Right. Sort of half asleep, Half a wick. Now, what is it doing now? Ruffling its feathers, I should say. Now it's doing a little dance, a little jig. Oh, that's strange. All right, back to sleep, Napoleon. I'll cover you up again. Yes, Father. A little dance. A jig, you called it. Father, if you were to ask me, it was the mincing steps of a woman. Napoleon has never done that before. These are absurdly imitated birds. You see, I think that it is imitating that... that presence. Are you saying that the presence is female? Yes, I certainly am. Oh, dear me. The I... parrot has sensed it or seen it and has copied it. You can't believe your parrot was just now seeing the apparition in this room and imitating it. Oh, yes, absolutely. And it is still here. Professor Gildare... Let me speak to you as a friend. To believe that a parrot, an entirely physical creature with limited perceptions, is able to see what you cannot see and imitate it is more than any sensible person can believe. More than I can believe and more than you should believe. Are you quite finished? I can tell you more. I... <sighs> Father, it's... It's at me. Here. Now... Ah! Oh, God, there's a clawing closeness about it. I, I feel it here. I right hear. Oh, it horrifies me. It, it horrifies me. As I said when we began, what if an emotion had entity? Taking it a step further than the emotion of love, take hate with a hand raised in anger. Take revenge, despair, fear. What if all those could appear to you and me as actual beings, haunting us and making themselves unwelcome visitors? All fancy, you say? Wait with me and see if the fanciful takes on substance when I return with more of the mystery in Act Two.
Professor Gildea, famed scientist, within one inch of receiving the highest accolades of the scientific community, had one great failing. He was either unwilling or unable to let any person come close to him. That extraordinary mortal, the self-sufficient man. Then one day, a presence invaded his home. An invisible, loving creature. And after that, the professor was never the same again. His friend, the priest, Father Xavier Murchison, takes up the story. Although his doctor gave Professor Gildea a clean bill of health, I persuaded him to take a week off, cancel whatever speaking engagements he might have, and put the laboratory in his own home out of his thoughts. He went up the coast. After a week, I got a card from him posted from the Cape telling me what train was bringing him home. Ah, Father Murchison. I didn't expect to see you here at the station. What a nice surprise. Well, I didn't expect it myself, but as it happened, I had to visit a sick person right in the neighborhood this afternoon, so I thought I'd chance it. Yes, to see if I was still a sick person, huh? Are you? No. No, I don't think so. A week on the Cape, the sea air, you look just fine. Did you have good weather? Yes, perfect, glorious. You were quite alone up there? <laughs> Do you mean was I pursued by my ghost? No. No, I wasn't, thank heavens, quite alone. The beach, the seagulls, the sea, my only companions. Ah, I've never seen you look better. I'd ever felt better. Not a care in the world. Father. Father, what am I kidding myself for? I'm terribly anxious to find out if that that thing is still in my house. Oh, you've seen the last of it, I'm sure. Uh, I have had it, and now we'll see. A taxi. Pitting, Pitting, pay the cab and take my bag. Will you, Father Murchison is staying for dinner? Uh, let's go in, Father. Well, I, I was thinking, Professor, perhaps I'd better scoot back to St. Saviour's for a few hours and then return in time for dinner. I know that I'm being selfish... Well, we've climbed a flight to the study. Let's go in. Ah, I've always liked this room. Now, if I'm to remain here, I'd better call St. Saviour's. Well, there's a telephone in the hall. I'll pour small glasses for us both. Whiskey? When Pitting comes upstairs, I think I'd prefer a cup of tea. Well, as you wish. Uh, turn on the light. The telephone is right there. Now that you've had your tea, Father, and I've had two whiskeys, let us see what we shall see. Are you really relaxed? No feeling of apprehension? Not a scrap. But I am curious. I'm waiting for it. What? Whatever is that? It's Napoleon. He's telling me, you've been back home for an hour, why don't you uncover me? I'll take its cover off. I never heard a parrot make a sound like that before. It was certainly a most unparrot-like sound. Yes, it is. It's not imitating some sound it's heard, is it? I'd like not to answer that question. Are we alone? Uh, what's that? Your visitor, this thing, is still here. Uh, yes. Ah, huh. how do you know? It, uh, it came into the study a few moments ago to welcome me. It came? How? Well, simply by making me feel that it is here and, and happy to see me. I'm amazed. Oh, Father, I wish I could make you believe that there is an intruder in this room. You know, there are doctors who specialize in these things. You might consider... Father, Father, you... please... The scientific mind deals in proof positive. If within the next few weeks, no, days, I, I cannot come up with the proof that some unknown being is actually here, I'll let you take me to any doctor you like. You see, I, I, I cannot go on like this. So I shall just have to reconcile myself to your opinion, Father. My opinion? Yes, that I am suffering from an absurd delusion. The way you talk about this presence is so convincing that I... I... 
Still, in the doctrines that I subscribe to, a mysterious presence... A cloying, horrible, suffocating presence. I know of nothing written or implied to account for such a thing. So, naturally, my dear friend, I doubt everything, all of this, must be in your mind. Two days later, my telephone rang at St. Xavier's. Could I stop by that evening? He had to see me and to come that night, no matter what time it was. Father Murchison. Oh, Father Murchison, come in. Come in, please. Good Lord, Professor. What in heaven's name is the matter? I've never seen you looking like this. Something has come over me. I cannot take it alone anymore. Well, why didn't you call me yesterday? 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 When was that? You see, since yesterday, I've passed a decade and a day. All right, all right. Is it still here, the presence? Stronger than ever. What amazes me, Father, is that you do not feel it. That it hasn't made itself known to you. Father, I I may need to turn to the church, after all. The church? What are you saying? To have this thing exorcised. Would you do that for me? Exorcism? Well, that's quite a step not to be taken casually. Well, can't you imagine what it might be, Father? Now, look. Look about this room. What do you see? What do I see? Nothing unusual. It's not right in front of me, is it? No. No conventional, white-robed, cloud-like spook. Heavens, no. I hadn't taken leave of my senses that far. No, no. No. Uh... Uh, Look again. Only Napoleon. His cage is uncovered. Is that it? He's the proof? Yes. Yes. You were once quite suspicious of the parrot's abilities. You said before uh, the parrot was aware of the intruder. Yes, and now I'm sure of it. You see, he's been watching that presence from the very first day it came in the back door. Oh, is that why you started keeping its cage covered during the day? Exactly. Exactly. An act of cowardice on my part. Napoleon's behavior was beginning to get on my nerves. I think the proof I needed developed when I spent a week at the Cape. Now, let me let me show you the results of an experiment. Well, do I have to do something? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you and I are going to hide ourselves in this room. And both of us will watch Napoleon. You're covering his cage again. Yes. Now... When we're quite hidden from him, I'll pull this long string I've attached to the cloth and remove it. And the... whatever you call it will reveal itself? I'll stake my reputation on it. How strongly have you felt its presence? In the last two days? Tremendously. It is always watching me. It is here now. And what is the most destroying to me is that the damn thing oozes love. It creeps over me. It crawls. Oh. Ah, now, now, if you're ready, let's hide ourselves behind the drapes on either side of the window. I'll pull the string and uncover the parrot and watch. And then you tell me, am I mad or very sane? <laughs> I am trying to be rational and calm about what I saw. The parrot moved along its perch and then suddenly turned towards the door. With its eyes, it followed something we could not see across the room, fluttering its wings with excitement. Whatever it was, it came nearer and nearer to the cage. The parrot then put its head through the bars stretching it as if asking to be scratched. I can almost swear I saw a white finger pushing at the feathers on its head. Something was stroking the top of the parrot's head. Then it started making that unearthly sound. What do you think, Father? It is there. Here. Extraordinary. And that... That sound. Ever hear anything like that? No, never. 
It's more peculiar than it was before. Napoleon is imitating the sound of the thing. He hears it and repeats it. What is so exhausting to me is that this thing is not evil or frightening. Just the reverse. The thing admires me, desires me, it loves me. That's what I cannot stand. Has it occurred to you that it may be the voice of someone who has been here while you were away? All right. Let us see. We'll soon find out. It's late, but I have to know. Uh, Pitting, Pitting, will you come up to my study, please? Now, before I went away, I, uh, I noticed Napoleon was trying to do a kind of, of walk. And then when I got back, you remember that cry, like the one we just heard? Always oh, pitting. I, I'm, I'm sorry about the hour. Pitting, oh, pitting, while I was out of town, did anyone come into this room? No, certainly not, sir. Except the cleaning lady, the maid, and myself. Yes, and the bird. Has it been here in its cage the whole time? Oh, yes, sir. Have you noticed the parrot talking lately in a, well, shall we say, rather a peculiar, disagreeable voice? Yes, sir. A soft, sing-song-like. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Well, well, since when? Well, since you went away, sir. He's always at it. There. You see, Father. Oh, yes, pitting, that's all. Thank you. Father, is that, uh, is that proof enough for you? Uh, believe me, there is no trick to this cloying, loving creature. It is here. Oh, no. No parrot speaks in a voice it has not heard. But we hear nothing. Nor do we see anything. But Napoleon does. You saw how it was holding its head through the bars to be scratched. Yes, it seemed to be doing that. It was. It was doing that. It, it... I beg your pardon, sir, but as long as you were up, this message came for you, and I neglected to call it to your attention. Oh, a message? Thank you. Huh. Oh, they, they've got to be joking. Another lecture. One week from today in Washington. I seem to have made a commitment six months ago. Well, I can't do it. I'll have to cancel. I'll I'll call them in the morning. I'll tell them that it's it's impossible. I could no more lecture in the state I'm in than the man in the moon. Oh, Father, help me. What can I do? Help me. In ancient days, When an incarnate creature made itself known, a forked stick, a sprinkle of holy water, a stake driven through its heart, dispossessed the evil from its spirit. But how to rid a man of what he cannot see? Is this some devilish magnetic force drawing to the professor the very emotion of love he cannot bear? More on this when I return shortly with Act Three. Father Xavier Murchison found it indeed difficult to believe what his eyes saw and his ears heard. It was no task for this devoutly religious man to believe implicitly in the miracles recorded in the Bible, but the notion of any supernatural intrusion into his daily life was more than he could accept. Nor could I believe that the professor was being punished for his lack of humanity, his deficiency, or let's say inability to love or be loved, and so was obliged to endure the affection of some supernatural thing. I prayed for him, and the following day, as soon as my church duties were in order, I went round to see him. What time is it, Father? Uh, A little after six. What has become of pity? He has left my service. What? Left you? He doesn't work here anymore? Left. At noon. May I ask why? It was all part of this dreadful business. Last night, I... You see, I I felt it. I actually felt it. The thing... As I was going up to bed, I I felt something moving along by my side, and then it... It nestled up against me. Good Lord. I seemed just like a real human being, but I couldn't see it. Three times, I felt this gentle and yet determined push... Against me, as if to coax me and to attract my attention. I could hardly breathe. At the top of the landing, it did it again, squeezing me with loathsome, sickening tenderness against my side. Oh, help! I 
stood there, screaming. And finally, finally, Pitting appeared. You called, sir? Where were you? You heard me call. Couldn't you get here any quicker? I came, sir, as quickly as I could. Is anything the matter? Everything's the matter. You see, I'm being pursued. Can't you see it? Can't you understand? Take it away from me. Get this thing away from me. What, sir? Get what away from you? You insensitive machine. Can't you see it? It's... it's... I, I, I can't breathe. What is it you wish me to do, sir? Oh, pity, pity. Oh. I'm sorry, pity. I'm sorry. Forget what I said about about being a machine. You see, I didn't mean it. I'm, I'm upset. It's nerves. It's all nerves. You see this, this thing? Will that be all, sir? No. No, don't go. Stay with me. Don't leave me alone. You see, Pitting, I'm being tormented. Please, please, I beg you, Pitting, don't go. I need you. Professor, I beg <sighs> to remind you, I was engaged as a houseman and a butler and to sometimes assist you in your laboratory, but not to sit up all night with you or anyone else. And while we, we are having this little conversation, sir, may I say that I wish to leave your service at the earliest possible opportunity. So, that's how Pitting left. And last night, Professor, what did you do? I sat up. All night? All night. In your bedroom? Yes. With the door wide open. I wanted it to go. With the door open, I hoped it would. And it didn't? No. No, it never left me for a moment. But it didn't touch me again. When it was light, I sat down, tried to think, organize myself. Perhaps I should give that lecture in Washington after all. After all, but then you see, it happened. The parrot made that incredible sound again. Where is it? I don't see the cage. I got it out of here. You see, I, 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 I took it to a pet shop. I didn't even want the money. I said to the man, here, here, take this beast. You can have it. Oh, my dear father, when I left that pet shop, I felt so good, I laughed aloud. You should have heard me. <laughs> I went shrieking down the street. A millstone had been lifted from my shoulders. But, but, but you see, when I, when I got back to the house, I, I went upstairs. And it was, it was still here. It's here. Now. It will always be here. Tell me, what am I to do? I mean, as a friend, as a priest, uh, uh, help me. <laughs> Still there. I cannot pretend to doubt the reality of your misery in this house. You must go away. Right away. Uh, when is that Washington lecture? Uh, in, 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 in five days. All right. Go to Washington tonight or tomorrow morning. No later than that. Go to your usual hotel there until after the lecture. Uh, so far as you know, this thing has never followed you out of the house. Oh, no. No, never. I was, I was free of it at the Cape. Then go. Leave. That'll be five days or six days. And after the lecture, let's see if this will end. Hope, my dear friend. Hope. I don't know what they thought of me at St. Saviour's. In the past weeks, I seem to have spent more time on the Upper East Side than in my parish. Ah, uh, fortunately, my associates are quite understanding, which indeed I pressed them to be when I asked for two days in order to go to Washington to Professor Gildea's lecture. Identifying and dating artifacts is essential to the archaeologist. The old carbon-15 test is ineffective beyond 50,000 years. But the newer, the, the, uh, newer techniques... Oh, go away. Will you go away? Uh, what we, what we use now is the potassium-argon process, which is most... Oh, please, please go away. Leave me alone. 
It, it, it measures the decay of radioactivity in a mineral, and it is far the most effective after 50 million years. No! Ah! No! I can't! I can't go on! It's after me! It was a dreadful sight. To see this great professor suddenly stop his lecture, look around him like a cornered animal, and strike out with his hands, warding off something. Then he ran to the edge of the stage as if pursued, and didn't know which way to turn. Ah, mercifully, at that point he fainted. A doctor gave him a sedative, and I didn't leave his side until he was safely back at home, in his house, in his bed. <sighs> Father... Murchison, is, is that you? Yes, it certainly is. I'm glad you're awake. What day is it? Tuesday. I brought you back home last night. You've been sitting here since last night? Well, it was the least I could do. It was all a mistake. I should never have advised you to go to Washington. You weren't fit. No, I was perfectly fit. But I was accompanied by that abominable thing. It no longer leaves me. Even for a moment, it won't stay anywhere unless I am there. You see, Father, it loves me. That's what it is. It loves me persistently. Wait. It's here now. Right now, as I talk to you. It's on the edge of this bed, nestling up to me, touching, touching me. Can't you feel that it is here? No, no, I can't. I kept asking myself over and over, why? Why? What have I done I've been thinking about that also, and I can find only one answer. You have an answer? There is a reason for this? Perhaps it's a punishment. For what, for heaven's sake? You hated affection. You put human feeling aside with contempt. You had no love for anyone. And you didn't want to receive love from anyone. So, perhaps it's a punishment. Do you, do you honestly believe that? And it's hard to believe, but... I... I am being punished. It may be so. What, what can I do? Try to endure it. Endure this thing, this loathsome presence? Yes. Try to welcome it. Possibly then the persecution will stop. I, I know it means me no harm. I know it seeks me out of affection. It was led to me by some extraordinary attraction which I hold over it. I know that. But to a man of my nature, that is a horror. If it would hate me, I could bear that. If it would attack me, I'd become a man again. I could fight against it. But this, this gentleness, this brainless, sickly, physical presence, I cannot stomach it. What does it want of me? Love, Professor Gilder. I haven't any love to give it. Oh, oh Father Murchison, I... I I'm dying of this. Why I'm dying. giving affection so hard you for you? You didn't hear a word I said, did you? Listen to me. Give it your love and it may go. It is not possible. Yes, it is. <sighs> Having received what it came for, it will go. I cannot believe that, Father. You talk like a priest. Suffer your persecutors. Turn the other cheek. I speak to you as a friend. It may be some strange form of lesson. Oh. I have had lessons, painful ones, and I'll have many more. Now, instead of resisting this presence, welcome it. Please, please, try. I... I can't. <laughs> Hatred, I can give it that. Hatred, for I hate it. I loathe it. Ah. Oh. oh. Father. Father Murchison. What? It... It wants to go. Wants to go. Open the door. This door of my bedroom. I feel it wants to go the way it came. It, it wants to leave me. Go downstairs. Open the door for it. I ran down the stairs and opened the door. Was it my imagination? Or did some shape hurry past me across the avenue turn up the path into the park. Was that it there? A dark form seated on that park bench? Had it finally finished its work, fulfilled its desire, 
and now returned to its former existence. I ran back upstairs to tell Gildea the news. You... You saw... You saw it yourself. Sitting there. Well, I thought so. Well, not exactly. I mean, I couldn't make it out. N- not in detail. But, but you actually saw it yourself, didn't you? It wasn't my imagination, was it? Was it? Uh, there was something on that bench. Thank the Lord. It has left me. Left me. Father, I feel so strange. Empty. A shell floating. Floating? Where am I going? Father, Father, where did I go wrong? Was everything wrong? All a mistake my whole life? (laughs) They talked about love, people did, but it frightened me. Is that why I turned against it? I couldn't bear it. Father, I feel so light now. I, I think I'm not coming back. Not anymore. Even as I sat there, he passed away. I made the sign of the cross and gave him absolution. His face that had been so careworn, crossed with lines of fear and hatred, softened. It was the face of a child. Hoping for love. A doctor was called. The cause of death? Well, I would say heart failure. Yes. Failure of the heart. He wasn't an old man, doctor. Age has very little to do with it. Would you say it might have been prevented? Yeah, possibly, if he had watched himself. Uh-huh. Taken better care? He should have lived quite differently. I think you're right, Doctor. He should have lived quite differently. Uh, Father, that's about all I can do. Thank you. I'm afraid it's all any of us can do now. He's in the hands of Providence. And so the curtain rings down on the tale of the skeptic who rejected love and the man of faith who fought for a man's heart and lost. I have a theory about the extraordinary tale you have just heard, which I'm dying to put to you. I'll return shortly. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.